Hello. Hi, everybody. It's Ken Davenport. Welcome back to the Producers Perspective Live. If I looked a little awkward when the curtain rose there, it's because I was desperately trying to finish an email right before Mary said, Ken, you're on. Uh, but I got it out. And you wouldn't have known unless I told you. But that's what I do is I often reveal things I'm not supposed to. Anyway, welcome back to the Producers Perspective Live. Uh, it's Friday. Happy Friday. Thank God it's Friday, I guess, if we know what day it is or whatever day it is, if you're watching this on replay, I was reminded that many of you watch on replay, and when I say, hey, it's Wednesday, you're like, it's not Wednesday, it's like Saturday morning, it's like 3 a.m., I can't sleep because I'm you know, wondering what the heck's gonna happen and I'm scrolling through CNN, which you shouldn't be. Forget the news right now. This is the only news you should be listening to. Yay Friday, says Benny Lumpkins Jr. Yay Friday. Uh, great weather here in New York City today. Uh, we'll see what the weekend holds. Hopefully everyone will keep that social distancing up. We had some fantastic weather here today. Um, it's all, oh, I thought it was Thursday. Thanks for the reminder. I know. It just sneaks up on you. It sneaks up on you. Um, so hope you had great weather. Hope you're all feeling good wherever you are. Uh, if you We had a great guest last night, Lauren Lataro, choreographer Lauren Lataro, uh, waitress Mrs. Doubtfire joined us. Uh, she was uh, a ton of fun. Uh, she told us how we, you know, it's totally okay not to write King Lear during the pandemic. That was like such great advice from her. She was like, don't put pressure on yourself. Just absorb, process what you're going through as an artist and the great stuff will come out later. So don't put too much pressure on yourself and it's okay to not do something. And then she literally was like, oh, by the way, I'm creating this giant dance piece in July with like all of the Broadway shows out in front of the, I mean, it's amazing. That's who she is. Go watch the replay and you can see how she gets done all the things uh, that she gets done. Uh, you can watch the replays for all of our episodes as well. They're all there. And don't forget, it is still okay to donate to the Actors Fund when you watch a replay. In fact, that's when we're getting most of our donations on the replays. So I guess you're like, oh, I want to see it again. Oh, it's really good. It's really good. I'm gonna throw some money at Lonnie Price or Andrew Lippa for his Tiger King musical or Alan Cumming talking about, I think he was talking about candles. Is he making candles or getting fit? I don't remember. I'll have to watch the replay. Anyway, tonight's guest, uh, it's like choreographer week here. Miss Stephanie Clemens is joining us. Another Broadway vet performer transitioned over to choreographer. She uh, was an original cast member of this musical you've never heard of before called Hamilton. You know, that one also in uh, in the Heights. Uh, and by the way, she's the dance captain of Hamilton, which means she's got to keep that thing all in line. So we're going to get into that because that is not an easy job. Uh, also, she was the associate choreographer on Bring It On and is now since gone all the way to choreographer, just got back from uh, co-choreographing Fly uh, with Andy Blanken Bueller. Um, so give lots of hearts and likes right now if you want to see Stephanie Clemens come join us and that will spread the word about what we're doing and make some more money for the Actors Fund. So go ahead and do that. Uh, today's news, we had some very sad news from Arendale last night in that Frozen, unfortunately, is going to be closing. Um, this is... Uh, Casey Levy, uh, heartbroken to answer Frozen will not reopen. Um, this is, it's so, it's it's awful um, to see this. I mean, this is a musical that's, I was actually looking forward to bringing my daughter. I mean, that thing opened and I was like, my daughter is one. It'll be running until she's 16. I'll be able to bring her then. And uh, no, sadly, no. Although I have this sneaking suspicion. Wouldn't it be very Disney for this to go away and then come back? They've done that before. They closed Beauty and the Beast. They brought it back. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Frozen freeze another Broadway theater in the next year or so. So that's um, some news that hit us. Um, don't forget about the Daddy Long Legs reunion that's coming up May 21st, 8 p.m. Just added Paul Nolan to the list. So that's going to be a ton of fun when we reunite that group and talk about, frankly, the first uh, Broadway off-Broadway live stream that we did way back in 2015. Who knew? Oh, and also the biggest news, and, and really what I have to show you, is last night I challenged all of you, and especially one person, uh, to send in a photo of your Corona uniform, which is, this is mine. Uh, it's like a golf sort of sweatshirt, a hat covering my Corona cut, um, sweatpants sometimes. I mean, everyone has a Corona uniform. So Drew Rieger, one of our uh, most loyal guests, 
guess. No. Look, he's there is look at that. First of all, nice place, Drew. I mean, look at that. It's palatial right there down in Baltimore. Uh, and it's a very far off shot of his Corona uniform. I like it. It's short. He wears shoes. That's good. Uh, I, I've chosen not to wear shoes unless I go outside to walk the dog. Hat, I like it. It's a good one. If you have a Corona uniform, something you wear every day, send in a photo. We may feature it. Hashtag Corona uniform. Uh, okay, that's enough of that. Let's see what Stephanie Clemens' Corona uniform is today. Let's bring her on to the live stream right now. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi. Hi. How are you, Ken? I'm good. How are you? I'm so good. Thank you. My uniform today is a black sweatshirt. And I have to be honest with you, I'm really warm because my house hasn't adjusted yet to the temperature change. It's so nice, but I'm sweating a little. So this... I usually wear this black sweatshirt and now I'm very hot. So I feel like a black sweatshirt is a very dancer choreographer. It's like, just give me a sweatshirt. Just throw on a sweatshirt and some leggings. You no, know, it's like there. a nice sweatshirt. So I feel like I can dress it up if I want to. But today we're chill. I feel like, you know, Friday night at home. Yes, I'm uh, wearing black sweats. That just, it's a very dancer look I have going on right now. Good. You got the sweatpants on. I'm a big fan now of the like shirt and uh, like a nice shirt and sweatpants, which I'm calling the Corona mullet. Which is like business up top, sweatpants. Growing a mullet, I love yeah. it. Wait, did you by any chance see um, Pippa and Steven's um, video that they made? Pascal, Pippa Sue, and Steven Pascal. They did. I don't know. They just did like a fundraising video, yeah. and they sing this beautiful mashup, and they sing the whole thing, and it's like four minutes long, and then they stand up and they have underwear on, and when they walk away, it's so it's so cute. You should check it out. It's really good. It's great. I mean, those are some very attractive people. So a lot of people are probably Googling right now. I mean, it's uh, a great video. It's, it's a about underwear. Yeah. Philip with underwear. I think uh, going to come out of the coronavirus. I think Stephen is, is uh, going to be on at some point. Mary's talking to him about coming on. Uh, Mary's looking for that video right now. I can see it backstage. She'll post it. So you said, um, you said house. Where, where are you in the world? So I actually live in Long Island. Um, I moved out here back towards the end of my In the Heights days. And, you know, I always said that um, I wanted to move to the coast of an island somewhere. And I was thinking more like Caribbean. <laughs> but um, in order to keep my career, I had to stay close. And then I found this really beautiful little nugget of a place called Long Beach, which feels very much like California, but is, yeah. you know, a Long Island railroad trip away to New York City. And I moved here. And, um, and I've been here ever since. And you know, it's funny when I was doing If Then, I would quick change in my final costume. I would quick change my street clothes um, underneath, and I'd run, 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 run to Penn Station. It was like my final haul of the day. Like literally, I would run from four, you know, every like basically every. I did one show at the St. James. Everything else has been in the Richard Rogers. So I just like run from Forty Sixth Street to the A train. Um, and you know, you're home in like an hour and I get lots of alone time, downtime to read and you know, do whatever. So I've been out here now for like, I think it's like 10 years. Wow, so wait a minute, I wanna scroll back because just in case people didn't quite understand, you underdressed your final outfit with your street clothes? Is that what you just said? Well, yes. So here's what happened. My dresser was in on it. It was great. And it, I would basically, the main thing, because of course my street clothes, my show outfit was like a dress with the midriff showing and all, yeah. no, right? So I would yeah. underdress my underwear and then she would quick change my outfit that I had worn for the day. So it was very easy to get out of my costume because it was like a slinky dress and I'd have my sh my regular underwear on. So I'd have taken off my mic pack, put it onto my street, my regular <laughs> unders. And then I'd quick change and I'd run. And Miguel Cervantes, I don't know if you know Miguel Cervantes who is now yeah. Hamilton, who was in If Then with me. And the two of us would, would run because he was making a New Jersey transit train. And um, and I love Adina and I love her and we would always give her crap because she never came to places on time. <laughs> and so if the show went up after eight, it was like eight eleven. Okay, if the show went up after eight eleven, we were not making our trains. And so we would just be like backstage, just like come on, Adina, eight oh nine, eight ten. But she she almost always made it by eight oh eight. Um, towards the end of the run, it got a little late, but. Uh, <laughs> 
but anyway, she, and she had a kid and she would often have him upstairs, Walker. And now that I have a child, I understand the struggle is very real. I can't even imagine how she did it. Um, but yes, I did underdress uh, to race to the Penn Station at the end of that show. It was my final, my final move for the show. Who is the, let's give the dresser a shout out. Who is your dresser? Oh my God, she was so, so, so incredible. Um, uh, you're putting me on the spot. I'm sorry for getting her name right now. Uh, don't worry. It's not, it's not live, so we can edit this out. Yeah, I can't remember her name oh right now. God, she was, she was, was so incredible. She was awesome. <laughs> uh, we'll just go back to like making fun of Adina for being late. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 don't worry about it. We'll, we'll just do that. Um, you have a, 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 a kid. How old? I saw this on your Instagram. One? Yeah, he just one? turned a year two weeks ago. Oh, congratulations. So how is this period with a one-year-old? I mean, it is, I feel like, I mean, you hear all these stories and like parenting and, and whatnot, it's difficult and all, but it's like every parent is like wearing a cape and we just don't know it, you know? And I, I think like even the process of labor and going through that and as a dancer and understanding my body and that the difficulty and how intense it was it's just like i look at every mom like even the crappy ones and i'm like you're amazing <laughs> like you did that <laughs> so you're so, your kid in the grocery store but you are still amazing literally i'm not kidding that's how i feel um okay. so yeah it's been such a learning experience and so incredible and obviously all the emotions right there's moments that are really hard there's so many moments that are wonderful, especially my wife is um, an essential worker. And so she's not home all week. And so he oh, and I have a lot of time alone together. Um, and it's just like, it's such an amazing time to watch him grow. And, you know, there's so much happening and my heart is so heavy a lot for our industry and so many of our friends. Um, and then I look at him and I'm like, I would never have had this time with you. And yeah. so it's such a bittersweet thing that's happening. Um, so. so where were you when the virus hit the fan, as I like to say? What were you doing when it all stopped? Yeah. So you mentioned in the intro, I was just co-choreographing a show called Fly. So basically the timeline went something like my wife and I hadn't been on a vacation since I before I got pregnant. And so um, and Ramsey, my son, travels with me everywhere. Like so for all I, I'm also the global supervising choreographer of Hamilton. So I traveled to all the companies internationally and in the country and he would come with me everywhere. Um, and so he and I were in California with my mom. And so my wife met us and then we were going on a four day getaway to a friend in South Carolina. Now, I don't know if any folks are watching from the West coast, but the, the way that the panic descended on New York the West coast was in a different world. Like I would call home and people are like, are you scared? Because like the truth is, is like I actually got sick in California. Um, not got sick, I hurt my back, and I had to go to the ER. And the first question they asked me when I got there was, "Have you been to China? Or anyone that you've been in contact with been to China yeah. recently?" And I was like, and I really was like not up on the tip, you know. I was like in tech, I was like totally focused on the show. I was like, been to China? What? An, that's like the first question yeah. they ask me. I'm like barely breathing, and my so um and. And so I guess in the hospital, they were privy to it. But I feel like everyone around me was like, what is going on in New York? And um, so when the show was done, uh, when we opened, it was like March 9th. We flew to South Carolina on March 10th. And the people we were staying with were like Lysoling our bags. And I was like, OK, that's like a little much, but, you know, fine. Um, uh, you know, and I get it. Like she was like, I have kids here. And I was like, great. Like, I don't know if I would have done that, but thank you for yeah making sure we're all safe. And so um, we were there for four days and I flew home on the 15th of March. And on the 16th was like the last day where I feel like on the 17th was the day that sort of like things really started to like lock it down. Obviously Broadway made announcements much earlier, but it was, you know, I was just, the, I got home one day and the next day was the day I'd never stepped in a building ever again. <laughs> Um, so it was weird. It was kind of like weird because I was not, and then I got, so like I, I flew into New York and it was like mayhem here. And then it just like the world's kind of stopped. So, yeah. It's, it's to think about all you mentioned, the global supervisor of Hamilton, so uh, Hamilton, God dang it. It's Friday. Hamilton, both big hits. I mean, both I mean, big hits. One, really. I both, both. Male protagonist, very fiery gentleman, like, you know, looking to get something done. <laughs> um, parental issues, maybe. So the uh, 
you're a supervisor for all these productions, right? And all of a sudden, they just all stop. Yeah. Um, and I'm just imagining. So, do you ever go to some of the other productions all over? And I'm like, when you when you're putting them up, and you're like, I wonder if, I wonder if people are going to like it here, because you see audience response from totally different nations, right? So what, what's it like seeing it in a different place? And do you have that moment of like, I wonder if it'll be the same, or maybe it was just a fluke back in New York? You know, when I was in in the show in New York, I had a friend from London who um, was coming into town and, you know, I was like, she's like, I want to go see a Broadway show. And I was like, okay, well, duh, I'm going to get you tickets to Hamilton. She's like, I'm really not interested. I'd much rather see Aladdin. She was like, I'm sorry, but she's like, I don't know. Like she was so candid and I was obviously, I was like hurt. She, I mean, she was so frank and I was like, I was a bit hurt, but I was like, okay. And our mutual friend was like, you should, you should probably just see Hamilton. Like just, she's going to get you the tickets. You should see it. And so begrudgingly she showed up row E for her. Um, and oh, yeah, after yeah. she texted me intermission, she's like, you know, I don't really know all the stories but this show is absolutely life-changing and incredible. And so it was that moment mm -hmm. that I thought to myself, not that London is so far off, obviously there's many much, like Hamilton's going to Australia now that's much further, um, not so much culturally, right, but distance. So I feel like that one experience kind of let me know that just doesn't matter if you have, you know, that American sort of underlying background knowledge, like there's something about the show that really hits people. Um, and when we got to London, it was like, I mean, the cast started and it was just as magical, just as powerful as the three US companies I had previously put up. And um, and it was special. And then when audiences started coming, you know, we ha we didn't know, I, like, to be honest, we all were like, we hope this is a hit. If not, like, it'll be a good show. It'll run for a couple months. And the like the dancing and the singing is nice. <laughs> uh, and it was like, it really like transcended the cultures. It really, people really got it and understood. And obviously there's ties to London, they we mentioned them. We mm -hmm. talk about them in the show. Yeah. King George is a huge head, and all of that. But um, you know, it we didn't know. And the truth is, is it really lands with people because the story of um the less fortunate in society and the story of the people who are uh, not given opportunity when they win. That's the underdog story we yeah. all know and love. Um, and to to know for me, I, I remember what, when I used to watch as the dance captain, I'd watch the show when Lynn was in it often. I would think, my God, is this ever going to do well? Because there's something so powerful when Lynn would come out, right? And he would say, you know, Alexander Hamilton, I wrote this. It's like, it was so powerful. I was like, will that ever land again? Yeah. And then it did over and over and over again. And so, um, you know, there is something really magical about the show that it, it transcends all of those things. So we'll see how Australia does. Yeah, listen, I've seen it with, with multiple people playing the role and it is so effective each time. But seeing Lynn do it, I used to describe it as like, it must have been what it must have been like watching like Mozart conductors on opera. Uh, like, it's just like you're like, oh, this is your entire world. We're just living in it. We're just like taking a vacation from ours and going to your world. Yeah. And now everyone's uh, going to see that happen on Disney Plus. I know. No, I'm very excited because I just got it for my kids. So I'm like, woohoo. Great. Uh, Great free on Verizon, too, by the way. Verizon's giving it away for free for a year. Uh, there's a tip for everybody. I just saved you all some money. Great. Uh, so talk to me about um, the transition you're making from being an associate choreographer, performer, associate now to choreographer. Have you always known that you wanted to be a choreographer or is this something that has just come about? So I have to be honest with you, I never wanted to be a choreographer. Um, I didn't, it was not my intention. I wasn't really setting out to do it. Um, but I have like a, like multiple origin stories where I set out to dance in something and then I was dancing in it and then I became the choreographer. And this like dates all the way back to like a summer at sleepaway camp when I was supposed to be a dance counselor and like they had hired too many and they were like, we created a position for you. You're going to be the resident um, musical choreographer. And I was like, musical choreographer, what? You know, that summer we did like Bugsy Malone, Jesus Christ Superstar, if anything happened the way to form, I choreographed like four musicals that summer with you know, all the kids. And, um, and that was when I was 19. And then it just happened over and over again. So like when I was 26, I was in, uh, 
or 24. I don't know who knows is early on in my career. Um, I was in Heights and then they were putting up the tour and I was the dance captain and Andy was like, you and Michael should be the associates. And so I was the associate choreographer of the first national tour of in the Heights. And from there at, you know, 25, years old is when I did the tour of Bring It On. And so it kind of like started early because people pulled me into it. Um, and, you know, another example of like a totally different team, I was working on If Then and um, Mark Myers was unavailable to put in the first replacements for the national tour. And so they hired me as like the associate choreographer to like set because I was also the dance captain of that show. And so, you know, transition always feels like a weird word to me because it it was always ha like both things were always happening at the same time. I've been choreographing. I like choreographed my first off Broadway show like the month after I was it was in an off Broadway show when I was 21. So mm -hmm. kind of always happened like this and it was never like me putting I still don't have a choreography reel to this day which is embarrassing but I don't um because it just always was people being like will you choreograph this will you choreograph this and so you know I feel like the two things happened equally and I will say of my performance career is like you know yes I've been in shows and played roles but oftentimes I'm the dance captain, which is like a segue that feels like easy to sort of mm -hmm. jump between worlds because you're already running auditions and you're, you know, right. you're making, helping to make decisions in a way that trains you to be the choreographer. Right. That's a great path and a great tip because people end up asking, what happened is people asked you, all you had to do is say yes. I'm, okay, I guess I'll do this for you. Yeah. 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 And that's a hard yes for me. Like, honestly, I, you know, I had time in my, um, in that mid 20 range where I just kept saying like, okay, you know, God or whoever you believe in, I was like universe, like, tell me what, what to do now. Like, you know, bring it on was done and like, what's next. And that week I got three choreography jobs of varying sizes. Like one was small, one was a little bit bigger, but it was like, it just kept smacking me in the face from like 19 years old onward. <laughs> so I just, like you said, you know, it's like, I just opened the door that was unlocked for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say now at 37, I'm definitely pursuing that more. Um, but yeah. And then like one, I mean, like when Hamilton started, I was performing and now, you know, five years in, I'm like, am I even a, you know, I, am I performing anymore? Yeah. Are you done? Are you done? Or are you I don't feel done. But like when you get to have these relationships with producers and casting directors and whatnot um, in this, it, in one way, it feels odd to suddenly like jump back over. Uh -huh. Do you know what I mean? But I would, I totally would. And I love performing. It's such a different muscle and I, I love it very much. Um, but I guess we'll see. I guess we we'll, we will see it, you know. Well, let me ask you about something else and see if you missed this. So one of my favorite new things to do for all my guests is I go on their Wikipedia page okay. and I try to find the most random thing I can find and then put you on the spot about it. I love that. So yours is an is an, is a mind blowing one to me. Um, so I'm just going to read the quote, everybody. Uh, it said you went to Rutgers. Is this true? Okay. And it says you doubled ma double majored in genetics and microbio research and modern dance. And then it starts a sentence that reads her undergraduate work in cancer research. And I, so I'm, okay. Yes, so look, Drew, uh, look, Drew obviously beat me to it. Um, he's in his Corona uniform, he is sleuthing as well. I love it. But tell me about, this two different sides of you and why you went one way or the other, or maybe you're still doing genetics in your part-time. I don't know. But it's fascinating. I, gen I love genetics. I love genetics in a way that's very close to my passion for dance. Um, so that is true information. I actually also minored. I had uh, one minor um, uh, and I almost had a second, but I, minored in psych because my mom thought just in case I was not successful at the above two uh, aforementioned uh, <laughs> degrees that I had, she was like, just another backup. Um, so yeah, so that's true information. Uh, the backstory to this is a number of things. One, um, my parents thought it was really important to have a backup. So I was like, great, 
I'll do a backup. I love school. I love studying. Um, when I was in college, I went, you know, all four semesters and every summer session and I loved it. Um, but the other thing was I, my best friend growing up, um, whose name was Katie Andrika, she, um, was diagnosed when we were 19 with, um, non, uh, uh, acute myeloid leukemia, AML. Um, <clears throat> and she spent most of our senior year in the hospital. She went into remission before college. And then just before college began, she uh, relapsed and she was over at Rutgers at the hospital there um, and as an inpatient. And the crazy part of this whole story is, is I did really well on my SATs and I had a you know, really great GPA. And I only applied to Ivy League schools and NYU is my backup school. And now my dad got a master's from NYU. My grandmother went to NYU before women even went to college and none of the schools accepted me. So every Ivy League and NYU. And I applied mainly for first science degrees at these schools. I was planning on going to school because my parents were like, You're, we're not paying for an education for dance. You know, we're, you have to go to science. And so I applied to Rutgers in June. And I ended up there with my best friend when she passed away, when she oh. was a sophomore. So it was all meant to be. And yeah. I was doing research in the cancer lab downstairs that was sending up clinical trial medicines to her floor. And so that was not, it was yes on purpose, but it was also like exactly what the path was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, I now have an organization called Katie's Art Project where I connect all my Broadway friends and artists that I know with these kids who are facing life-threatening illness to create um, what we'd like to call legacy projects, both for the artist and the kids. Uh, and it's awesome. We like release songs on iTunes and music videos and, and create art that we, you know, show an art gallery in the summer in Tribeca, New York city. Um, and so all of the, I feel like all of the degrees, the genetics and the dance and everything that put me at Rutgers, um, was all for me to be with my friend. Cause that, you know, is one of the biggest moments of my life. And, um, and yeah, once when after she passed away, I was quite reclusive, I'll say. And um, and I just studied away and I took the MCATs actually and I applied to med school. Um, and I got into med school and my parents said, you know, you can't we I was like, I'm gonna defer for a year and if I don't make it, make it, whatever, where's my camera on the thing, make it. Um, I'll go back to medical school. And I, in that first year, I did a lot of stuff, but in, in, on month 10, I got my equity card doing the first national tour of Bombay dreams. And then it was sort of snowballed from there. Um, but to this day, every time there's like a lull, I'm like, should I go back to school? I mean, literally, like right now I'm like, mm, should I contact Columbia about their doctorate? And, you know, I'm the same way. I think we all are. It's a bit of this imposter syndrome or a bit of this, like, should we have chosen another path or whatever it is? Every once in a while I go like, because I did almost went to law school. Yeah. Even after I went to Tisch, I went to Tisch at NYU. And then I was like, maybe I'll just go to law school. Right. Maybe everyone's, you know. So, yeah, I get it. What are you doing to stay creative now? Uh, you've got a one-year-old. You're dealing with a pandemic. It's ups and downs of this crazy world. Um, how are you yeah. staying creative and staying positive? Um, I try to take as many classes as I can. You know, so many of my friends are offering free dance classes. I've taken Carla's, John Rua's. I take Andy Blankenbuehler's class. Um, I pop on Capizio in the morning, sometimes do a little ballet warm up while my son's like playing in the background over here. Um, so I take lots of classes. I also teach a class. I wear my son and I teach class on Sunday. So I wear like a parent and me class where you can wear your baby and dance. Where is it? Where on my you? Instagram account, 11 a.m. every Sunday. Great. Mary's going to make sure we have your Instagram so everyone yes. can watch you dance. Um, and that's so fun. And people send me like videos of them where sometimes they're wearing their dogs or like a, a stuffed animal because they don't have a baby, which is very cute. Um, and so I'm trying to dance a lot. Sometimes I feel like I'm dancing more now than I was when I was just flying around the world checking on companies of Hamilton. So that's actually been really nice. Um, and I'm, you know, I have been speaking about developing these new new works and I had two people had been reaching out to me and I was so busy before uh this as we all were I'm sure um and so I'm working on developing these two musicals and like 
I don't know where they're going to go, but, you know, sitting down and just getting with creative teams and like having a deadline every week to just like chat is awesome. And it's been so fulfilling. And I have a friend, her name is Liz Kimball, and she kind of like invented this thing called NROC time and it's non-results oriented creative time. Um, and I think for all of us who are artists in the business, you know, when everything that we do is attached to a deadline and monetized and, you know, you have to do this and um, it's really nice to find, you know, 15 minutes a day. And now a lot of us can find more time. I mean, it's, I'll be honest with you. It's really hard when you're chasing a one-year-old around to find, you know, any time for yourself, he's not a napper. And so I have to go on a run to get him to nap once a day. And so it's like, I'm checking my emails while I'm crossing the street. It's like hilarious, but, uh, but yeah, that's, it's been really, really great. I heard you mention Lauren. I'm sh Lauren's amazing. She's setting up a hole. I'm, I'm yeah. so I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not definitely not on that level, but, um, but yeah, little things here and there, dance classes and working on new stuff. Any tips for all the people out there uh, on how to stay positive and, and keep your chin up through this and keep creating? You know, I did, I, as part of Katie's Art Project, we do like a little live every Friday and I spoke to John Rua today and I feel like everyone's experience of this is so different. And he was talking about how he, like I can go out on walks every single day and I can get fresh air because I live in the burbs sort of, you know, and he's in Queens and that's just like not really an option for him. And, and I think that advice coming from me it may not um, appeal to different people because everyone's in such a specific, unique circumstance. Um, but I feel ultimately like, um, you know, today I was thinking as a dancer who had a baby, I'm, my body has changed so significantly. And so during this pandemic, I've obviously had time to sort of like do certain routines every day that I didn't have time for. And the change is so slow that you don't see it happening, right? So like we all want to wake up on pandemic day 700, mm -hmm. day 47, day 62, wherever we are right now. And like today is the day that I'm gonna, and then like insert finished goal here, right? Like we just want that. And we forget that like every day, even just like the intention, switching our intention or or thinking on it over and over and over again, it actually begins to move mountains. And before you know it, you know, you are so far from where you began, but we don't know that while we're making these little tiny steps. And so I feel like we just have to know and trust that even though we may feel stuck, um, that things are moving around in and underneath us uh, that we don't see right now. But when this is all said and done, we'll find that we wake up in a new place. I love it. That's great advice. Uh, look at this. Uh, <laughs> I like Angela Grouch. I love that, Angela. Oh, so punny. So punny, Angela. Um, I love it, but so true. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank, thank you so much. You know what? We don't know each other that well. And what, I love about this pandemic is it's just bringing people together. And I look forward to being in literally the same room with you now and maybe working on something. I love it. Absolutely. It would be an honor. You're incredible yourself. I It's an honor to speak to you seriously. Thank uh, you so much for having me. My pleasure. Thanks for being here. Good luck with the non-napping one-year-old. That is brutal. Brutal. A lot of <laughs> uh, and we'll see you very soon. Cool. Take care. Thanks, Take care. Right. Stephanie Clemens, everybody. What about that? What a great story. I mean, she's doing dance classes with her one-year-old who doesn't nap. And I'm I'm not a mom, and I'm like, when does my kid go down for a nap? I can't even imagine. Uh, my wife is, every mother out there uh, does wear a cape or two. Uh, my wife, I she's like Batman, actually. And when her doula was like Robin, I was like just like sitting back, like watching the whole thing happen. So um, shout out to all the moms. Again, let's have Mother's Day again. Uh, so that wraps up another week of the Producers Perspective Live. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed tonight's episode with Stephanie or any of the episodes we've had, don't hesitate to throw some cash at the Actors Fund. That's why we're here. That's why we're doing this. That's why this is episode number 48, I believe, right? Mary's nodding her head at me. I wish we could do a second screen of that. Uh, I also want to thank so many of you. If you can see my eyes darting off the sides because I'm scrolling through the comments to look for something. I want to thank all of you who are joining us from all over the world, including Hiro Rasa from South Africa. We have someone from South Africa tonight. I love it. Uh, thank you for that. 
Uh, thank you for all the donations from all of you who have been giving so generously to the Action Fund. Please keep it up. A uh, few more things to say before we finish up. Mary, who's on Monday? Come on and say say hello to everyone and tell us who's up. Mara Isaacs, come on. Come on, Mary. Hello. Look, it's Mary. Mary's here Hi. to say happy weekend to everybody. Mara Isaacs from Hamilton. I mean, God <laughs> damn it, I can't end a week from Town. It's the other H1, right? Yeah, Town. All right, you can go away now. Uh, producer of Haiti Sound Mars, fantastic. Done, she does a lot of consulting as well, um, from nonprofit to commercial producing. Super smart lady, uh, Tony Award winning producer. I can't wait to he hear her perspective on how things are going to come back, uh, how Haiti Town is going to come back, and what's it going to look like when we do. Uh, don't forget to keep up the social distancing. Just keep it up a little longer. We can make it through this thing uh, and continue to make it easier for Broadway and all the theaters to get back. And now we're going to end with something to make you smile, as we always do. And this one, boy, this is an inspiration to all the husbands out there. So first of all, this video comes from one of you. A viewer sent us this video. So I encourage you to send us stuff. Uh, as you know, if you're just joining us tonight, we end each uh episode with something to make you smile, just something to put a smile on your face so it can take you away from uh, CNN or uh, you should either, either watch these something to make you smile or you should watch Stephanie's Instagram because on uh, Sundays at 11 she dances with a one-year-old. I will be tuning in. Uh, so do that or watch one of these videos. So this one's special. Um, Kayla Hawkins was supposed to come to New York City for the very first time recently to celebrate her 30th birthday uh, and she had to cancel the trip, obviously. So her husband brought New York to Colorado Springs for her. So it's adorable. And at, they were going to see Wicked. Uh, and as you can see, this, by the way, is one of the best reasons to have a lot of kids because they can put on Wicked for you in your backyard. you got to see this. It's the most adorable thing. He even brought a slice of New York pizza back uh, with them as well. So check it out. Mary will post it. Uh, it's on the producersperspective.com backslash smile. Go check it out, and it will lead you into a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Uh, thanks so much for being here with us and for continuing to support the Actress Fund. We will see you Monday with Mara Isaacs. Have a fantastic and very safe weekend, everybody. Bye-bye.